to my world. The first is the Control Labs team, who will be joining Facebook Reality Labs to help build the interface of the future. Their EMG technology has exciting potential for delivering natural and intuitive interaction for VR and AR, and I'm delighted to welcome them to FRL. The other is the birth of my first grandson, which has made the future much more tangible to me. Thank you, it was actually way more moving than I expected. Sitting there with him in my lap that first night with everyone else asleep, I found myself looking at his beautiful, tiny face and wondering what the amazing, unimaginable future he'd live in would be like. And of course, the one thing I was sure of was that VR and AR would be a transformative part of whatever was to come. That transformative VR future is what I'm going to talk about today, but the past and the present are the keys to the future. So let's start by traveling back to the early 1980s when I was a grad student in energy management and policy at Penn. As you can see, I hadn't yet discovered blue button-down shirts, or for that matter, personal grooming. What I had discovered was the personal computer in the form of the Vector Graphics VIP. The Vector sported a four megahertz processor and a full 56K of memory, which was hot stuff in those days, and I instantly fell in love with the freedom of having an entire computer to myself. Back then, the world we live in was just being born. The IBM PC didn't yet exist. VisiCal could ship for the Apple II the year before, so the first killer app was starting to make progress with early business adopters, but there were only about two million personal computers in the world, and most of them were owned by hobbyists, gamers, and enthusiasts. In short, back then, personal computers were more of a novelty than a real thing. But the more I used the vector, the more I began to believe. So when the IBM PC came out, I walked away from my PhD program to write video games like this. I appreciate that because you have no idea how hard it is to make that happen with a few thousand instructions per frame. <laughs> Writing those games was about the most fun I ever had, although my new direction caused considerable concern among family members who thought I was throwing away my career. That was an entirely reasonable opinion because in 1982, personal computers hadn't really started to change the world yet, but they would. And because I had had the faith to be there at the beginning before everything went big, I've had the opportunity to contribute in many ways, from games to operating systems to graphics and more. Never for a moment have I, or anyone else I know from those days, regretted the decision to dive in while it was still early days and help make the future happen. Unless you lived through it though, it's hard to comprehend just how much things changed as the personal computer revolution proceeded. Here's what human-oriented computing looked like when I wrote Cosmic Crusader. Then, here's what it looked like while John and I were working on Quake 15 years later. And finally, here's what human-oriented computing looks like on my work phone now. That is how much a truly revolutionary platform can change things over the years. Okay, back to the present. Let's map today's VR onto that same long-term trend line. VR certainly has as much long-term potential as the personal computer, in fact, I believe it will ultimately become the most powerful creative and collaborative environment that has ever existed, as I'll discuss later. But realizing the full potential of VR will take decades, just as it did with the personal computer. Right now, I'd say VR is clearly farther along than the personal computer was when I wrote Cosmic Crusader, what with Quest and Rift S, a broad and varied app portfolio that includes a million seller, and rapidly emerging enterprise applications, all growing nicely. VR is in a good place right now, and it's easy for us true believers to see where the trend line is headed in the long run. But realistically, we're still pretty close to the beginning of what's going to be one of the great technological revolutions of all time, which is actually awesome. It means that right now we're in the most exciting place. Most of the good stuff is yet to come, and it's our community that's going to make that happen. But it also 
also means that VR is advancing on two different time scales. In the near term, the next five years or so, VR needs to grow as rapidly as possible. And that's happening in a big way between us getting great headsets out there and a strong ecosystem built, and all of you creating the applications that will take VR into the mainstream. As Jason Rubin said, VR is happening now. At the same time, there's another future after this one, the next big step up that long-term trend line, a quantum leap to a whole different level that will be built on the work all of us are doing today. And when that future arrives, VR will explode the way the personal computer did nearly 40 years ago. VR hasn't changed the world yet, but it will. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir. You're working on VR precisely because you believe it will change the world. The interesting question is, when? Well, I have some good news and some bad news. I'll start with the bad news. I've made specific predictions about the timing of that quantum leap twice before at Oculus Connect, and both times I was too optimistic. This year, rather than making yet another Another prediction, I'm going to invoke Hofstetter's law. It always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstetter's law. <laughs> the honest truth is, I don't know when you're going to be able to buy the magical headset I described last year. VR will continue to evolve nicely, but my full vision for next generation VR is going to take longer. How much longer? I don't know. Let's just say not anytime soon. Turning breakthrough technology into products is just hard. So that's the bad news. But then there's the good news. That quantum leap into the future is still coming, and we at FRL are making it happen as fast as we can. So what exactly will that future look like? If we're talking about the long-term future, that's easy. VRAR is, in my opinion, going to be the most significant technology of the next 50 years. Just as personal and mobile computing have come to dominate our lives, over the 46 years since the first personal computer, the Alto was built at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Xerox Park started a revolution that ultimately led to every one of us either interacting with or being just seconds away from the virtual world almost every waking minute. That virtual world has touched nearly every corner of our lives, but there's one great limitation. We interact with it almost exclusively through two-dimensional interfaces, along with very limited audio. If you think of a human as a CPU with memory, input, and output, admittedly, not the most romantic framing, but accurate, then it becomes clear that the data received on the inputs, our senses, and the actions induced by the outputs, our motor controls, must define the full range of experiences that we can have in the world. Given that, our lives are enhanced if we can bring more useful information to our senses and perform actions that have more useful effects, resulting in better, more satisfying experiences, which is precisely why virtually every one of you has a smartphone with you right now. But relative to what you're capable of, that smartphone is a very low bandwidth channel. In contrast, VR and AR have the potential to give us all the bandwidth we can handle in the ways we're built to use it, and that will let us do more of what makes us human, especially socially. That's the fundamental reason why I believe VR, AR will be the dominant technology of our lifetime across the full sweep of our digital lives, Games, of course, but also so much more, as I'll touch on later. So to me, it's easy to predict that awesome long-term future. Predicting the next generation of VR is harder. I'm happy to share my thoughts with you, but there are all sorts of opinions about what the future of VR should, will be, and opinions are a dime a dozen. The most useful way to learn something meaningful about what's coming is to live by Alan Kay's great quote. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. That's what we're doing at FRL, and I view these talks at Oculus Connect as our yearly postcards from the future of VR. Today's postcard will share some of the recent progress we've made on inventing the future in optics, machine perception, and avatars. What I'm about to share is actual working prototype technology, not mocked up demos or concept art. Let's start by following up on Verifocal and the Half Dome prototype, last seen at F8 more than a year ago. The headset we shared at F8 was the result of several years of research and prototyping of advanced display systems. Half Dome was our first prototype to achieve two milestones. First, using Fresnel lenses, it supported a 140 degree field of view. Second, by physically moving the screens based on eye tracking, it changed the focal depth and kept the image sharp even when inspecting close objects. 
Today, I'm pleased to be able to share a new varifocal concept prototype, Half Dome 2, built by our display systems research team working closely with several other teams across FRL. Unlike the original Half Dome, Half Dome 2 is targeted primarily at ergonomics and comfort, both visual and physical. The new prototype is substantially smaller and lighter than Half Dome, largely because our optics team has managed to fold the optical path into a very small volume. Overall, we've been able to improve form factor substantially and reduce weight by a full 200 grams over Half Dome. The trade-off for that increased comfort is that the field of view is narrower than Half Dome, although still 20% wider than Quest. The varifocal hardware has also been considerably improved, so let's take a quick look at that. Varifocal now relies on voice coil actuators and flexure hinge arrays, eliminating any points of sliding or rolling contact between the moving screen and the pod assembly. This improves on the original half dome by reducing noise and vibration to imperceptible levels. All in all, Half Dome 2 continues the trajectory of Half Dome toward more immersive and comfortable VR displays. But there's more. As I said earlier, we're inventing as fast as we can, so I'm delighted to be able to share our first electronic varifocal system, Half Dome 3. We've replaced all moving parts in Half Dome 2 with a thin stack of liquid crystal lenses. Let's take a look at a prototype module to understand how electronic varifocal works. The next few images will be recorded through the electronic varifocal module you see here. This is a real camera shot. Each liquid crystal lens can be turned on and off to alternate between two focal states. Here we indicate that a lens is on by highlighting it in orange. When the lens is turned off, the focus shifts to the far object. And then when the lens turns back on, it shifts to the near object again. As you can see, a single, single liquid crystal lens makes a great pair of digital bifocals, shifting focus between two depths. To achieve smooth varifocal, we address the full stack of liquid crystal lenses, with each additional pair doubling the number of focal planes. In this example, six liquid crystal lenses are driven to sweep through 64 focal planes, and you can see the focal depth smoothly changing at the right as we cycle through different sets of lens states. In addition to having no moving parts, this approach allows significantly better form factor compared to its predecessors. Here, we compare our new electronic module to the original half dome assembly and see that there's a considerable reduction in size. When we integrate the electronic module into a complete prototype headset, it defines a new state of the art for VR ergonomics. This is still very much research today, but here's a view through an early Half Dome 3 prototype. As you can see, without varifocal, the cassette gets blurry up close. But the electronic approach is able to replicate the smooth varifocal experience of mechanical systems at all depths, a promising sign for the future. If you'd like to know more about our varifocal work, we'll be putting up a deep dive blog post today. As important as visual quality is, a great display is just one key component of a compelling VR system. Computer vision, a part of what we call machine perception, is another essential element of the VR experience. For starters, the ability to localize the headset in the real world with great reliability and accuracy so that virtual objects are rock solid is what makes the virtual world seem real. That's not all, though. The ability to detect and reconstruct the real world and import parts of it as desired enables mixed reality. That is, mixing and matching of real and virtual in VR so that you could, for example, bring a real keyboard, mouse, and desk into your virtual workspace and use them as easily as you would in the real world. Reconstruction also enables social teleportation, which lets you share your surroundings with another person or jump into someone else's part of the world, as we saw in Boz's talk. And of course, it's the foundation of live maps. Let's look at some of the recent progress from our Surreal team on reconstruction. I want to emphasize that what you're seeing is the real thing with no smoke and mirrors. This is a fly-through of reconstructions of real spaces generated by state-of-the-art reconstruction technology.
I think this is absolutely amazing. If you can imagine stepping into one of those and just being in it, this phenomenal level of reconstruction will enable extraordinarily high quality mixed reality experiences. Once you have a reconstruction, you can do whatever you want with it. Here are some pretty cool lighting effects in the reconstruction of Boz's dad's den. Rock-solid mixed reality is a key part of the future of VR, but there's still something missing, and that's people. We need to add truly convincing avatars to make VR ubiquitous because, as Yasser Sheikh from our Pittsburgh lab puts it, proximity determines social relationships, and social relationships make the world go round. Being together in person will always be the most satisfyingly human way to interact, but the technology we're developing has the potential to be the next best thing. Let's take a look at where we are with some of that. I'll start by picking up where we left off last year, with a codec avatar head shown next to actual video of Steven speaking. Good morrow to you, my boy. It's healthier to cook without sugar. Thank you, she said, dusting herself off. That's amazingly realistic, but the level of expressiveness is pretty low, and expressiveness is perhaps the most critical part of social interaction. One of the important advances over the last year has been ca capturing more of that, as you can see in this next video. Here, Kevin's facial animation is being driven in real time entirely by camera. In the center are avatars. And again, they're animated in real time entirely from cameras in the headset. Well, um, what can your face do? Can you show us? Well, I've always hoped you would ask me that question. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I have some pretty good, I think, mouth movement. Mm. How about your eyes? Can you, can you look left, right, up, down? Mm -hmm. um, good, good, good. Yeah, I'm going to be surprised. Ah. Ooh. Mm. I, like my, I think one of my favorites is puffing my cheeks. Mm. The mouthwash, mouthwash commercial. Mm hmm And rolling my tongue. Mm. Mm, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> pretty hard to believe that those aren't videos, huh? Although... To be fair, it, right now, it doesn't always work that well. Anyway, it certainly doesn't take a huge leap to imagine how doing that in VR could be sound like us. And uh, the purpose of it is to be able to connect people across distances. Again. This is just a first step. What you saw was generated offline, not in real time, although it will become real time in the not too distant future, but it's promising. All this is still research with a lot left to do, but codec avatars have certainly come a long way. I think the three research areas we just looked at are pretty cool, but where this really gets exciting is when the pieces start coming together. If you put codec avatars together with reconstruction, you start to get true social teleportation, where anyone can be with anyone else, wherever they want, working with a mix of real and virtual. Let's take a very early peek at what that would be like. To set the stage, here's a, uh, this is the stage in which codec avatar data is captured initially. Um, so um, this is where we put people in, we capture the information, and now we've done a reconstruction of that space so that now we can put a codec avatar in it wish to spend uh, time with uh, and not be restricted only to those people who live close by. Uh, that's the promise of it. And this is research work that we've done right here in FRL Pittsburgh. Uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the demo that you've seen. And we all look forward to, to
to what the future brings. Thank you. Again, there's a long way to go, but this is a genuine glimpse of the future. It's going to take all the innovative technology we just saw and a lot more to make the leap to the next generation of VR, but there's more to it than that. There's an important lesson that we can learn from Xerox PARC here. The PARC researchers invented a wide range of revolutionary technologies, from the laser printer to the bitmap windowing interface to WYSIWYG word processing to object-oriented programming. If that was all they had done, they would have been wildly successful. But they also integrated all of that into the Alto, and that is what changed the world. Similarly, new VR technologies will need to be woven together into a complete, tightly integrated platform in order to make that quantum leap. It's the sum of the parts that will deliver that breakthrough experience, not technologies in isolation, as we started to see when we put the Kodak avatar in a reconstructed environment. Which brings us to the question of exactly what that integrated next generation platform will be. Rather than starting with technology, I'm going to approach that question from the perspective of what overall user experience we'd want the platform to deliver. And here, I'm going to return to a theme I've talked about before, my desire for a virtual collaborative workspace. For five years now, I've been wishing for a VR workspace that I could configure any way I wanted, with monitor quality virtual And while I'm at it, I'd, it'd be great to have the ability to manipulate both real and virtual objects with my hands, complete with haptic feedback. I would use that in a heartbeat and I believe that it would spread like wildfire, the way personal computers did back in the day. Even better, the hardware software stacks and the overall platform needed to enable the full range of uses for that virtual collaborative workspace are so broad in general that they'd enable a vast space of applications and a flood of creativity across gaming, entertainment, communication, education, and productivity. Again, just like personal computers did. I am highly confident that a great virtual collaborative workspace would open the door to the entire next generation of VR, which in turn would unlock human potential on a massive scale. What would it take to make that collaborative workspace a reality? Well, without question, we'd need enough resolution and good enough image quality so that virtual monitors were at parity with real monitors. That would require very high res displays and much improved optics. I personally think visual acuity needs to be 2020 or better, but that's just the start. We'd also need the ability to render at that high resolution and to either do that with a mobile GPU or transmit the data over a wireless link. And that very likely means we would need foveated rendering, which may mean we need a new graphics pipeline and would certainly mean we need great eye tracking. Next, we would need excellent real-time mixed reality so that we could be aware of the world around us and move about and interact with our desk, chair, key keyboard, mouse, and other surroundings. We would also want to have persistent, shareable virtual objects in the world so that we could, for example, set up a customized team workroom or work on tech art or some code with a teammate. To do that, we would need a localized version of the live maps technology that Boz talked about. That is, a private live map of our local physical surroundings. We would also need to be able to see our hands and our body in order to truly be present in the virtual world. And we'd want to do more than just look at our hands. We'd want to use them as the intuitive, highly dexterous manipulators that they are in the real world. So we'd want both haptic gloves and hands so accurate that we can interact with both the real and virtual worlds flawlessly in mixed reality. And if we're going to be doing work with our hands, we'd want clear and comfortable vision within arm's length for hours of use per day, exactly what Varifocal is designed to deliver. We'd also want proper spatialization and propagation of virtual sounds, so vir virtual objects and spaces would sound as real as they look. For collaborative work, we'd obviously want the compelling avatars we discussed earlier, and we'd need accurate real-time face, hand, eye, and body motion, as well as highly realistic appearance. Less obviously, we'd need a wider field of view so that everyone in a meeting could see everyone else. That's essential for social interaction, as are voices that sound like they're coming from the right people in the right places. We'd want to be able to 
share our real environments with each other, both for social purposes and because physical objects will often be important to the discussion. And we'd want to wrap all this up with great ergonomics to make it comfortable to be in VR for hours at a time. And that would require making everything I've discussed compact and power efficient. And then we'd finally have the complete platform that my dream workspace would be, could be built on, which I think we can all agree would be pretty awesome. But how do we get from here to there? Well, FRL has been pushing the envelope for the last five years on everything I just talked about. We've been focused on bootstrapping individual areas, like the hand tracking Mark talked about, which originated as FRL research, because that's what it took to get to next generation technology. Now that we've built many of the pieces, though, it's time to start putting the full platform together. To paraphrase Alan Kay, the best way to predict the next generation of VR is to build it. And FRL's mission is to build time machines that let us peer as far as possible into the future. So just as Xerox PARC built the Alto and showed the way to the future of the personal computer, FRL is going to build a true next generation concept prototype with the objective of showing the way to the long-term future of VR. This prototype is going to be aimed squarely at collaborative virtual workspaces with the objective of enabling fully remote work that has all the benefits of working in an office in addition to the pluses of both virtual and remote work. One reason we're making remote work the North Star is because it's a great way to connect people in VR, and connecting people is what Facebook is all about. Another reason is that making remote work really effective would have a hugely positive effect on how we live. Imagine what it would mean if you could work remotely as effectively as in person, or someday, maybe even more effectively, because you could have collaboration tools in the virtual world that could never exist in the real world. People wouldn't need to live near where they work. They could live near family, or where housing is affordable, or just wherever appeals to them. Commutes would vanish, and there would be dramatically fewer business trips with huge energy and environmental benefits. Companies would be able to tap into talent around the world, and the ability of talented people to find meaningful, high-paying work would no longer be determined by where they happen to have been born. That is truly a future that defies distance, and that by itself would be more than enough motivation. But there's yet another reason for building this prototype, and that's that a collaborative virtual workspace is something we in FRL would actually use. And when you're inventing something new, it's critical to know the customer well and have a rapid feedback cycle with them, and how better to do that than building something for yourself. So the key metric for our prototype will be whether we find we choose to use it for hours a day to do real work. If we find it that useful, so too will millions of other information workers, most likely including you. The long-term potential of next-generation VR is tremendously exciting, but I want to be really clear that this is still high-risk research. At best, it will take years to get to a prototype that proves out the concept. And Hofstetter was right. It always takes longer than you think, and that's especially true for turning research into something usable. So there's exciting potential for that quantum leap down the road, but for the foreseeable future, VR will be all about the quest generation. Again, VR is happening now. Anyway, however long it takes to build that compelling next generation prototype, we will keep at it until we get there. Now again, this will be a prototype, not a product. You won't be able to buy it. It won't be sleek or affordable or highly manufacturable or as durable as a consumer product needs to be. It will surely come up short of my wish list in some respects. That's OK. It just needs to be good enough to show the way to the next generation of VR. The Alto was limited, slow, and expensive, and it never became a product. But it showed that the personal computer could empower people to do new, highly compelling things. And that was enough to point the way to the Mac and Windows and everything that followed. So the virtual collaborative workspace is just a starting point, a catalyst. Like the personal computer, the next generation of VR will be a broad, general platform that enables a vast range of uses. Some of these will be improved versions of familiar things, but many of them haven't even been imagined yet. Whatever those applications are, I'm confident that the next generation platform will make VR a part of daily life for tens and then hundreds of millions of people, and will begin to change the way we work, the way we connect, the way we live. So VR is going to shape the world my grandson will live in, but it's going to be a decades-long journey to that promised land, and it will take all of us to get there. 
The next leg of that journey will be built on the work all of you true believers are doing, exploring the possibilities of VR and taking it into the mainstream while we work to move the underlying platform forward. And whenever it is that that next generation platform does finally see the light of day, you will be the ones poised to use it to change the world. And your faith in these early days will be rewarded at a scale that's hard to imagine today. Cosmic Crusader was a labor of love. It only sold a few thousand copies, so I certainly didn't do it for the money. But it was the start of a path that 15 years later led to co-writing a game that tens of millions of people would play and that would be the template for a whole genre that's still going strong more than 20 years later. You too will have that sort of experience one day with VR. In the meantime, we're all going to have the adventure of a lifetime. It'll take a little more time than I thought to get to the next generation of VR, but that just means that these are going to be the good old days for longer. And these truly are the good old days. It just doesn't get any better than being there at the start and getting to create the future, and we are all unbelievably lucky to have the opportunity to do exactly that. <laughs> the future is waiting, just as surely as it was waiting for this kid 37 years ago. Let's go make it happen. Thank you.